good happy Wednesday morning, April 29, 2020. I'm Riley King and welcome to U.S. News, International News, Business News, and Political News with Riley King. Welcome to this morning edition. Let's begin. First up, coronavirus updates. U.S. federal inmate dies of COVID-19 after giving birth while on ventilator. She is believed to be the first female federal inmate to die of COVID-19. Today's biggest developments. Over 3.1 cases worldwide, including 1 million in U.S. U.S. federal inmate dies of COVID-19 after giving birth while on ventilator. China to hold largest political gathering after two months delay due to coronavirus. That is a look at the coronavirus around the world. Healthcare workers struggling with stress of battling pandemic. Let's take a listen to that video from CBS News. We're seeing signs that the mental health crisis is worsening among healthcare workers battling this ruthless disease. There's this heart wrenching story about a top ER doctor who contracted COVID 19, recovered, and then took her own life. Here's CBS's Don Daler. The world lost a frontline soldier in the battle against COVID 19. Dr. Lorna Breen, 49, a New York hospital medical director, became yet another casualty when she took her own life on Sunday. She had recovered from coronavirus, but some in her family believe she succumbed to the stress of what she witnessed every day. Colleagues describe Dr. Breen on social media as a true friend and compassionate warrior and a great emergency physician, great person, and great friend. These workers have seen more death than they've ever seen in their, their entire career. Dr. Ayman Fanous fears for other healthcare workers. He's head of psychiatry for SUNY Downstate. I try to give them the message that it's important as much as possible to take care of themselves as well as to be able to express uh, their feelings. He's seen a dramatic increase in the number of doctors and nurses seeking support therapy. As we see in war, when you get shot, you might not feel the full impact of the pain right away, but with time, You'll see more and more symptoms, um, more and more insomnia, you know, possibly flashbacks and nightmares. It's too many patients dying too quickly, uh, and we're not able to help them. It's just devastating. Dr. Mafazur Rahman is one of those who sought help. Well, how are you doing personally? Uh, it's, uh, wish I could tell you better, but it's, um, it's difficult. One of my mentors, someone I had known for the last 20 years or so, uh, passed away. Many of those caring for the sick and dying will need care themselves, even long after this crisis is over. Don Daler, CBS News. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Yesterday in Baltimore, there was a special election. Let's take a look at that video from WBAL TV 11 News, Katamara. It's fine, it's the new normal, or the new abnormal, depending on how you want to look at it. Here's what we saw today at Howard County's in-person voting site for the 7th Congressional District Special Election. We saw every shared surface sanitized, only three voters allowed in at once, and everybody had to wear a mask. It's crazy, right? Everybody has their face mask on. <laughs> and while political reporters expect to run into a candidate at a polling place on Election Day proper, you don't expect them to say this. I was surprised, but I'm, I'm happily surprised to see that a lot of people aren't out um, and they are staying safe and staying home. 
Republican Kimberly Klasik running against Democrat Kwaisi Mfume in the mostly vote-by-mail special election to fill Maryland's 7th District House seat and to complete the term of the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. 500,000 voters across Baltimore City, Howard County, and Baltimore County asked to mail in their votes. If you couldn't, you could do a drop-off at one of six big boxes like this or vote in person this one day only at one of only three locations and under strict conditions. At least I exercise my right to vote. That's the most important thing. Go through it, do it, and that's the most important part. Is it weird or is it worth it the way this is going on? I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it and they, it will pass. We're not fixing the issues that were happening um, before the COVID and I don't see things going, um, going up because of this. Is that why it's important for you to come out and vote today? For yes, candidates? absolutely, absolutely. The three in-person voting locations are open until 8 o'clock tonight. The six drop boxes are also available until 8 p.m. If you mailed your ballot in, it had to be postmarked by today. And because of the coronavirus, every batch of ballots that's received will go into a 24-hour quarantine before it's counted. Reporting live from Howard County tonight, I'm Kate Amara, WBAL, TV 11 News. All right. Wow. Kate, okay, thank you. And don't forget, for up-to-the-minute election results, be sure to head to our website, WBALTV.com, or use our TV 11 mobile app. And remember to turn on push alerts. Okay, and let's see that result for that area. And here is who won for Maryland's 7th District Congress seat. And this is the winner right here. Congratulations. Breaking, Boris Johnson and his wife announced birth of a baby boy. Let's take a listen to that video. Announced that the uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his partner Carrie Simmons have announced the birth of a healthy baby boy at a London hospital earlier this morning. Mother and baby are doing uh, very well. So uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, has uh, another child. Uh, and uh, uh, that means or may explain why uh, he will not be attending Prime Minister's questions today. Uh, his place is going to be taken by the First Minister and Foreign Secretary, uh, Dominic Raab. That news also confirmed in the past hour. Well, joining me now from Westminster is uh, Sky's political correspondent, uh, Kate McCann. So, uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Carrie Simmons have a baby. Morning, Adam. Well, we knew that the baby was due in early summer. And as you say, we were talking before about how strange it was that Number 10 wouldn't confirm that Boris Johnson would be taking Prime Minister's questions this morning. And now we know why. There's been a healthy baby boy delivered, as you say, at a London hospital earlier today. And so the Prime Minister now will face a difficult time ahead. He's just recovered from coronavirus, of course. He's been away from work for the last couple of weeks. The country is in crisis. There are many, many decisions that the Prime Minister needs to make going forward. And, of course, he's just welcomed a new baby boy. So difficult personal time ahead for him. He had said originally that he would be taking some time off, of course, as most new fathers do, to help out bringing the baby home and, of course, doing all the tasks that go along with that. But it will be difficult for him because, as I say, he's been away for a couple of weeks. We know from aides close to him that he was very keen indeed to get back on top of the agenda when he got back into Downing Street on Monday, uh, particularly on issues like personal protective equipment for NHS and care staff. He'd made that one of his first priorities. And we do know from his speech on Monday in Downing Street that he intends to start thinking about how the UK could move forward, maybe not come out of lockdown just yet, but certainly change some of those measures over the course of the next couple of days. So it's a pretty difficult week. Some lovely news, of course. A new baby is always welcome news. And it's great to hear that mother and baby are doing well. But it's such a difficult time for the Prime Minister and for the country. It does present a challenge now for Boris Johnson. Okay, and there you, want your videos. you go on that video and that report. Congratulations to Boris Johnson and his family. 
Dow futures point to a gain of 250 points ahead of the Fed decision. Stocks rose in early morning trading on Wednesday as investors looked for guidance from the Federal Reserve on the further path of interest rates with a gradual reopening of the economy in sight. General election says coronavirus pandemic impact quarter one profit by 700 million. Let's take a listen to that video from CNBC. results from General Electric, which uh, was up pre-market, and it looks like it's up a little bit now, even after uh, these numbers. The uh, company reported uh, a adjusted earnings per share of a nickel, uh, which is a little below where the street was, uh, at eight cents. The revenue number's okay, though. The estimate was for $20.2 billion, and uh, in fact, it came at 20.5. And the... Um, it looks like, it's funny the way they, they talk about this, industrial organic revenue growth, they give you at minus 5%, <laughs> minus 5%. So uh, it, it would seem simpler. I, I, there's a dash 5, and I assume that's minus 5. I'm sure it is. But, you know, it, it, it'd be easier if you just didn't call it growth. And then uh, organic orders minus 5, <laughs> orders minus 5. Um, industrial free cash flow, 2 point. Now, there they have a dash, and it is $2.2 billion. Backlog, uh, $401 billion, up 14%. There are quite a bit of comments about uh, COVID, uh, targeting $2 billion of cost actions and $3 billion of cash actions uh, to manage the risk uh, and mitigate uh, the financial impacts from COVID-19. Uh, and in the first quarter, COVID-19 negatively impacted GE Industrial by a uh, $1 billion and operating profit by $700 million uh, in the first quarter. It's not far from the lows that we saw when we were, we remember so well um, back in the financial crisis. And I remember that day, back, I don't know if you remember, Keith Sharon was here and I mean, it yeah. was really dicey that day. We got down about yeah. five and, and um, you know, it was an ML at well, that time. And, uh, but that no. was down, down in this, and now we're back where we were, uh, basically a little bit above that. You know, Joe, the one thing the company said, too, though, is that the second quarter, the, car, the quarter we're in right now, is the quarter that is going to see the full impact of uh, COVID-19. It'll be the first full quarter to have that impact. And they do say the numbers in the second quarter will be worse than, in, than the numbers in the first quarter. They expect those numbers to come down sequentially. Um, so that tells you a little bit about where things are guiding and where things are setting up. Again, stock's up by about 11 cents. Uh, but they're, they're telling people don't expect better news, at least not in the near future. Which is probably not a huge shock to to anyone, especially with a company like uh, you know like right. General Electric. Uh, our hopes and dreams probably have to be on uh, digital and virtual things, right? Technology, right. Right. Internet, those that have base, Netflix, things like that. it's not going to be this, right? That's for Lower sure. capital costs, right? For yeah. sure. Right. Okay, and there you go. Trump orders meat plants stay open despite potentially deadly conditions. Let's take a listen to that video. Parker, the food supply chain is a big and real issue in this country. It breaks your heart to see a potato crop rotting in the ground. It breaks your heart to see dairy farmers in Wisconsin dumping milk because they can't get it to market. Let's talk about these meat packing plants. The executive order to the president signed today. Is there any other motive in this aside from that food supply chain issue? Well, clearly, Brian, I think the president's reacting to alarms raised earlier this week, including by Tyson, uh, that, that large company, uh, warning that there could be problems in the food supply, the protein supply. Uh, he doesn't want America to run out of beef or pork uh, or chicken. 
uh, that would be a real serious problem. But the problem here is that this order is much more complicated. The reason those plants were closed is because they're not safe for their workers. And the president's order today uh, faced immediate backlash from labor leaders uh, and other leaders who were representing the interests of the workers at these plants who say you cannot force them to go to work in a condition, as you laid out at the top of this program, that is simply unsafe and unsanitary. Uh, given the situation going on here. So it's a real dilemma uh, for the government to figure out what their role is here. And we should point out, by the way, that there are other uh, issues here in terms of food security that we've actually not seen the administration act on. For example, those uh, food banks where we've seen footage of, of people waiting in lines for two hours, three hours in traffic to try to get food to feed their families. These are people out of work uh, who are not able to get food at grocery stores and going to the food banks. And we don't really hear that uh, issue rise to the top of the president's attention. Okay, and there you go. And thank you for watching this morning edition of U.S. News, International News, Business News, and Political News with Riley King. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. I'll see you back here later on today for another edition. Goodbye.